This is a one speaker meeting. Please welcome our speaker tonight, Justin. Just Rustin. Rustin. <laughs> Sorry. I'm Justin, I mean Rustum alcoholic. <clears throat> Rustum. But I met Justin walking in. Where are you, Justin? Right there you are, man. Justin was the first guy I, I saw when I was coming to the meeting. And I do what I always do because I'm I spend a little bit of time thinking about myself. <laughs> and so when I come to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, the first person I see I say, hi, I'm Rustum, I'm an alcoholic. And, and of course he was Justin and then you called me Justin. Anyways, it all works. I just, I, I gotta say that, you know, happy birthday and, and Michael, it was really great and congratulations all the chip people and I just, you know, I just loved it when the, when the one girl came up with the other girl to, to get the chip and, and said, you did it, ho. <laughs> I just, I was like, man, I'm at home. Yeah, fuck it. I'm with my people. <laughs> there, there's something about an AA meeting. You just, you know, I come in and I'm like, okay, we got dope shooters and PCP smokers and fucking Demerol suppository takers. And, you know, I mean, we're all, it's all, I mean, come on. I, I was actually thinking, I was sitting there thinking, man, what if we all like got high together? Ooh, man. This, this, um, it's, it's really an honor to be asked to share my experience and my strength and my hope. And I, I want to thank Michelle for asking me to show up. Um, I, I can't, I, I've talked to her a number of times and I, I just, I, I love this place. I love this place. Today I was taking a little run and, um, I was looking to shake the bugs off. They weren't. You know, they weren't like in the old days when they're really there, but just, you know, metaphorically bugs. And <laughs> we all remember those. If I could just get this one worm out, anyways. <laughs> just one more. Doesn't have anything to do with methamphetamine. Anyways, I was taking a run, and, and I was thinking about what I might lose and then I was thinking about what I might not get. <laughs> Imagine that. Here I am thinking about what I'm afraid of losing and what I'm afraid of not getting. Right? I'm running down the street and I see this woman and she looks at me <laughs> and she's just about to start crying. And I thought, ooh, I better keep moving, could be drama, who knows. Because I was thinking about what I might lose and what I might not get. I don't want to deal with someone else. But here's what happened. There's, there's, I, I superseded my brilliant intellectual process <laughs> and made, a, a, and, and, and there was something that automatically kicked in, and that was uh, always try and be loving and of service. And whenever there's an opportunity to help, help. So I slowed down, and, and you know, she was British, and she said, oh, thank God, oh, I'll need your help. And I said, well, what is it? And she said, I, I can't get into this apartment. I've just arrived from London, and I have the code, and it's not right. And I, you know, and she's like just about to start crying. And I said, I said, hey, we'll figure it out. You're not alone. And she just like lit up because she knew that I was, I was, I meant it. I, I was really going to help her. Now, of course, 20 minutes later, I was thinking, wow, this is like really a <laughs> trip here. <laughs> I didn't know it was going to be such a, a long service call because um, <laughs> you know it wouldn't work and then we called the manager and he said I can't give you that and I'm explaining to him and she's just off the plane and I mean you know it's a whole thing and then finally 20 minutes later the the uh, the postal worker shows up and we both just jumped on her I said oh thank god you're here we got to get in <laughs> 
And she said, oh, hey, hold on a minute. And I said, no, 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 let, let me explain, right? And then, you know, and then I said she's off the plane and this, you know, and finally, you know, she believed us. And she obviously knew the code and just went beep, 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 and the door buzzed. And, and she went, oh, thank you, thank you, you know, and she hugged me. And that was it. And I started running. And you're not going to believe this, but I stopped thinking about what I was afraid of losing and what I was afraid of not getting. I actually, it, I actually, it stopped. It stopped, and I just, I wound up taking a run for two or three miles and, um, and connected to something bigger than me. Because ultimately, that's what it's all about. Ultimately, it's all about something bigger than me. Because lack of power is my dilemma. And what that means is I can't quite figure that out because if the world was able to understand that they could just listen to Rustam 100% of the time and operate under my operating system how I think they should behave, then I, there's something in me that thinks, well, then it would all work out. But of course, what happens is I go out into the world and people are individuals, and they have, they have uh, dominion over what they tell their minds and what they do, and they have their own free will, and they don't always do what I think that they should do in many situations. And it just drives me nuts. It makes me go, if these fuckers would just do what I tell them to do. But it doesn't work that way because we're all individuals. So ultimately, I have to know that there's something bigger than me. Because it says that there will come a time that I am powerless over the first speedball. I mean, drink. Uh, it says it. That there'll come a time that the only thing that can keep me from that first drink is a power greater than myself. And, you know, I, I, I love the Marina Center. Uh, I have a, a really great memory of this place. Um, about 28, 29 years ago, the 99 cent store was the Royal Market, a little beat down neighborhood market. And I went in there in a semi blackout and <clears throat> shoved a bunch of stuff down my pants and in my jacket. And then after stealing all this stuff, I thought, well, I might as well just rob them. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I didn't have a gun, but hey, who needs a gun when you can just put your finger in your pocket and go, hey, stick them up, right? So that's what I did. And then as I was doing it, you know, like a, you know, a steak or a thing of coffee like fell out of my pant leg and <laughs> I was a little wobbly, you know, here I am all like, you know, 15 years old, right? My finger in my, my, my finger in my jacket, like stick them up, you know, and shit's falling out and so they kind of caught on, and I sensed the vibes getting a little strange. So I said, oh, hey, never mind, and I just walked out. <laughs> <laughs> and they didn't think it was, you know, they, they didn't find it real humorous. So they called the police. And I made it right out to the sidewalk right here. And I was taking a nice, luxuriously, luxurious piss. <laughs> when the cops showed up and uh, and I woke up the next day in the Culver City Jail. Do you remember that, Dad? <laughs> My dad's here tonight. He came and got me the next day. We were living just down the street then. It was pretty sketchy back then, wasn't it? Um, so I, I I like to remember that because that, that was like the good times. That was like the fun times. Oh, trying to rob a market, what the hell, spend the night in jail. That was, it was, it, it, you know, that was like during that period, I had, I have alcoholism. I can't get rid of it. I can, I can, I can have a daily reprieve contingent on a power greater than myself, but I cannot get rid of it. And alcoholism, an obsession of the mind, an allergy of the body, and a spiritual malady, 
is something that is with me for the rest of my life. And what I was looking for from the first time I got high, from the first time that I uh, smoked a joint and drank a half pint of peach brandy and huffed some gasoline at the age of six, um, <laughs> any huffers in the house tonight? <laughs> James, God bless you, man. <laughs> I'm a huffer. He's a huffer. <laughs> Anyways, from the first time that I did that little combination, right, marijuana, alcohol, and gasoline, I liked the rush. I liked the rush. The rush was good. And my idea of how I want to feel is being at the highest roller coaster in the world, right at the highest drop on the coaster, right in the middle of going down, while I'm geezing a speedball and having an orgasm, and $100 bills are just floating all over me. <laughs> but I don't want it just occasionally like, oh, I'm going to go out to the Red Onion and catch that, right? I, I, I want it just all the time. I just want it all the time. And life doesn't work like that. I, I cannot live with that sort of a buzz all the time, but that's what I went for. That's what I was going for. I was going for just the buzz all the time. And what happened is, from a very early age, I wasn't comfortable with who I am. Now, I didn't know that I have a spiritual malady. I didn't know that I'm bodily and mentally different than my fellows. I didn't know that I had alcoholism or drug addiction or marijuanaism or whatever it is you take to get fucked up, right? I didn't know that I had that. What I knew was that there was something wrong with me because what I saw was everybody else talking and getting along and it was almost as if, if it was rehearsed. One person would say, hi, how are you? Another person would say, hey, pretty good. What's you up to? And it would go back and forth and back and forth like they fucking knew what to say. <laughs> I, I would be like, well, hi, well, yeah, how are you? Or There's just something off. And what happened is when I took that little, uh, that little trifecta of gasoline, marijuana, and, and alcohol, uh, what happened is it, it was the solution. That was the solution. Drugs and alcohol were the solution. And I chased and I chased and I chased and, and it worked. Somebody keeps trying to come in that door. Is that just like a paranormal, paranormal thing I'm having? Is it the wind? Oh, okay. <laughs> Acid flashback, AC, okay. Um, and, and, I, and, and I actually really, I thought perhaps psychedelics would, would maybe get me there because I read some Carlos Casanata and I was kind of into it and he was talking about the moss and I remember taking a huge grip of mescaline and, and like seeing a moth like become like a butterfly and become an eagle and like I was really going to get there and... and, and and then I took, um, uh, I, remember, I remember being in New York, I'm 15, 16 years old, and, and I really, I was looking for something. I wanted answers. I wanted answers. And I took 10 or 15 hits of acid, like a whole bunch. And, and it came on, it came on in, in, um, uh, in the subway in Times Square. <laughs> and I, I was with a buddy of mine, and I, and I, I froze up <clears throat> because snakes started coming everywhere. <laughs> so I, I froze up, and I just grabbed the wall, and I was like this. And, you know, they were coming at me all over. And my friend said, we got we to get you out of here. And so he got me out of there, and I drank some Jack Daniels. And then, and then I thought, okay, I'm kind of cool now. I, gotta, I somehow I got to get the answer. I need the answer. I got to get the answer. So I thought, it's like, you know, one in the morning, I thought, I'm going to go out in the Central Park and just sort of feel the vibes and get with nature. 
And I, I went out in the Central Park, <clears throat> and I'm screaming at God, saying, God, just, just, do you exist? Are you real? Please help me, God. And, and then this, like, curtain appeared. It went like, and this curtain came up. And I thought, ha, ha, here, here it is. And I, and I pulled the curtain open, and, of course, there was nothing but, like, snakes and horrible demons and everything. And I, and I thought, and, and, and what I did, and I flipped out, and I ran back home, and I thought, see, that's it. That's all that exists. Just creepy, weird, fucked up shit. <laughs> you know, here I am, like, asking for God. I've had a horrible life. All this stuff has happened to me. Because what happened in my life is my, when, I was, when I was 13, my mother passed away. And, and she was young, and I was young. I was just, you know, that's a, I mean, look, any age to have a parent die is tough, but this, this was a, this was right, at, right at, a, at an age where it really affected me, and of course it affected my father and the rest of my family, but what I did was, I wasn't able to deal with that, and my father at the time was dealing with it the best that he could. And so what I did was, instead of knowing that, that as tragic as this is, life is a mystery and I'm not in charge, instead of knowing that, I turned it around and I sort of victimized what had happened. And then a number of bad breaks and misunderstandings and horrible situations followed. Uh, institution after institution after jail after jail. And so what I did was because, and this, this, is, this is, I think this is very common of someone who has alcoholism who is drinking and using, what I did was I made it all about me and what you were doing to me. Instead of being able to have any sort of objectivity and say, hey, you know something? I'm not gonna take the, the, the I'm not gonna take the 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 tact of a loser. I'm gonna take the tact of a winner and know that there's been incredible adversity, but I'm gonna work through this. I couldn't do that because I was being controlled by my disease. So what I did was I just, I blamed everyone. I blamed everyone. It was everyone's fault. Why is this happening? And it was very sophisticated, the levels of self-delusion that I would go to. It wasn't just like, yeah, that's it. They're all fucked and that's it. I mean, it, you, I, I really got very complicated and I, I, it became very complex in why others are screwing me over, in justifying that. And I, I, I was, what, what, what eventually happened is <clears throat> um, my father and I just, we, we, couldn't, we couldn't get along and, and there were a couple of really intense incidents. Is <clears throat> one where I robbed a pharmacy and took like 10 of everything that I had stolen from the pharmacy and <laughs> wound up naked with a hatchet slashing trees out in the road. But <laughs> so what happened is my father decided I got to send him to New York. So this was the, this was the, <laughs> this was the, um, so I went to New York and I was living with some friends of the family. I'm going to school, and things are happening. Like I'm, you know, I, I woke up out of a in a blizzard once, like, like two blocks from my place, you know, naked with a tennis shoe on. And I mean, you know, come on, that's not something that someone who is not an alcoholic does, right? You don't wind up in a wake, come to in a blizzard, and sure enough, I had a, two black eyes too. So somehow I'd lost all my clothes, and someone had given me two black eyes. Right? Um, <clears throat> so anyways, I, I came back to L.A., and I'm living with my dad, and things got even worse. And, you know, you can get an idea with the naked hatchet and, you know, 
you can get an idea of how sordid it was sort of becoming. So I <clears throat> don't need to go into a, a lot of details. Um, Michelle said I could speak to 9.15, right? No, just kidding. <laughs> I'll, be done, I'll be done at 10 to 9, don't worry. Um, what happened is my dad, I, I then was living in a place called the Optimus Boys Home. And it was it was a uh, alternate it was alternative uh, to California Youth Authority, which I really belonged at. But somehow we you know worked out a deal where I got to go to a a, a non lockdown place, even though everyone in there was completely psychotic and it was in Diamond Bar. I mean you've got to know anything in Diamond Bar is going to be a little fugazi, right? So. <laughs> I'm living at the Optimus Boy Home, Boy's Home, and, and then I decided, well, I am an adult, because I'm 16, ha, I'm going to fucking move to New York on my own, and I did, I moved to New York on my own, I moved into a place on 44th Street, <clears throat> right above the Lollipop Lounge, <laughs> it was a cold water flat, which means there was no hot water, so to bathe you would have to boil water and and uh, and put it in a pan and pour it over yourself. And there's a guy named Hothead Freddy that was the doorman at the Lollipop <laughs> Lounge. And pretty much every night he would be in a brawl. You know, he was just a guy who liked to fight. I mean, it was great. It was you know, it was New York in in you know 1979, 1980. It was just insane. And and I was I'm 16. Of course, pretty much anywhere I went, they would serve me. And what happened is I, I, started, I started using heroin because I thought that would maybe fix it. And sometimes, uh, I, you know, I mean, I'm using heroin and I'm, I'm, I'm shooting Placidils and I mean, it's just really rotten. I mean, you know, you shoot a Placidil, it's like not really meant to be shot. I mean, they're, they're really not even meant to be taken, right? I mean, they're just this side of Thorazine. Um, and, and what happens is I, 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 I cannot, that buzz that I first got with the little gasoline, marijuana, <coughs> uh, alcohol trifecta, that buzz, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't get that, I couldn't get it back. No matter what I took, I, I couldn't help but feeling um, pitiful, incomprehensible demoralization, and I couldn't help but feeling um, impending doom, <coughs> no matter what I took. So I decided I, it's time for Rustam to check out. So I, I, tried, to <clears throat> I tried to shoot myself and, um, you know, tried to pull the trigger, but I, I was unable to summon up the courage to do that. So shaming myself, calling myself a coward, I went down to <coughs> to Union Square Park and and I bought a handful, 15, 20, 25 uh, Valium number, blues, number 10s, and I guzzled them down with a quart of vodka. And I walked around New York City for <coughs> five or six days in a blackout. And I woke up on Fifth Avenue <coughs> and uh, one more time I, I was all beat up I looked, you know, I looked like the raccoon again, two black eyes, because I, I was a nasty drunk. I'd get drunk and just talk shit, you know, someone would bump into me and I, you know, I, you know how it is. You know what nasty drunks, I was a nasty drunk. And I had dried puke and blood all over my clothes, my clothes were all ripped up and I was laying on Fifth Avenue and I had what is known as a moment of clarity. For the first time ever I thought maybe I can't control it. <laughs> Maybe I can't handle it. I can't handle getting high. And, you know, the, and it, there was a blue sky. I could hear birds tweeting. People were walking over me going to work. And um, so <laughs> birds were tweeting. <laughs> it's my next book. Um, so what, what happened is I, I, I um, there was one guy I could call. My dad, my dad had gone south. He drank the Kool-Aid. My dad had joined AA, and he had just gotten real creepy. <laughs> <laughs> he, 
So, so he didn't. I'd call him up with the good con, and the good con, no matter how good it was, didn't work anymore. Um, and 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 there was one guy I could call, and I said, "Look, I, I'm in a little bit of trouble. I need a, a plane ticket to come back to L.A. and and um, and I I probably need some money to." get to the airport so he sent me a plane ticket and you know like $140 or $120 and I'll never forget the way I left New York uh, I figured out exactly about what I'd need for a cab and with the rest I went and I bought <clears throat> a case of Budweiser and about 18 uh, cans of whipped cream and uh, I'll never forget leaving New York thinking <laughs> I left New York, you know, chugging the beers and sucking the nitro nitrous off the whipped cream, throwing them out the window, going, how the hell with New York? Going back to L.A. Screw this city. And uh, I, I arrived at LAX. My sister came and got me, and, um, and she told me about Dad and said Dad's getting real spiritual, which was about the creepiest thing I've ever heard. And, you know, we, we got home, and about an hour later, he was in a meeting. He came in, and, and, and I saw something in my father that I had never seen in him. And what I saw was the psychic change that happens once we surrender. And a couple days later, he said, uh, I'm going to a meeting. Do you, you want to come? And my options were rather minimal. <laughs> so I, I, I went to a meeting with him, and, um, and of course my uh, juvenile uh, probation officer was the main speaker. <laughs> so that, that kind of threw me, like, you know, maybe he'd arranged it or the two of them were talking and, you know. I'm not self-centered. <laughs> I never think about me, right? Like, here I'm thinking he would put this together with this guy who, you know, because I immediately went, oh, fuck him, cop, right? <laughs> That's like where my mind went. But then people took cakes. And what happened in watching these people take cakes is uh, as much as is, is my genius mind knew because, I mean, come on, look at the shape I was in, right? <laughs> so... Is as sharp as I believed I was, because it's always this incredible delusion that, you know, like like the guy's pushing a shopping cart, and you're like, do you want to stop drinking? And he's like, no, I'm fine, right? I mean, <laughs> the denial in alcoholism is just I incredible, right? So my denial was alive that you know I was you know, I was going to be okay because, like all alcoholics, there was no difference in me that. I, my great obsession was to somehow, someday, control it. And I had, had followed that into the gates of hell, and I was banging on the door with everything I had. And I was, you know, pretty sure I wanted to go on into hell. I wasn't sure about this place. But what happened is, contrary to everything that was going on on a cerebral level, there was something that, that just hit me in my heart with all these people taking cakes. Because I, I just... I, I, there was something that hit me in my heart that I knew that these people weren't conning me. I just knew it wasn't a con. I mean, yeah, they all sounded like pimps for AA, but it wasn't a con. And they all said the exact same thing, but in different ways. They all said, uh, my life was a mess. I came here, and my life's much better now. And, and what happened is I, I, my dad had six months of sobriety or seven months of sobriety, and I, I started going to meetings uh, with my dad, and I made a decision early on. I, I, I came in, I'm sober 25 years, so I, I came in um, 25 years ago. Uh, my sobriety date's February 1st, 1984, and what happened is I, I made a decision that I didn't necessarily believe that there was anything, sort of God or anything, but it said in the steps, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. And so what I decided was to try the 12 steps and see if I had a spiritual awakening. And what happened is I did them, and I 
had a spiritual awakening of the educational variety, and I've had them over and over and over and over again. Um, and just tonight, I was at dinner doing step work with a sponsee, and I got a call from a family friend, from someone I've known uh, since, since I was born, pretty much. And the call was that he was dead at 52 or 53 years old. And uh, 24 years ago, in 1985, I was at a party where he was at, and he was so drunk that he couldn't stand up. And of course, I had a year and you know, change in sobriety. I, I thought he was kidding, because I, 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 I couldn't believe someone was that drunk. I called him the next day, and I said, I said, you know, I don't drink, and I don't get high anymore. Do you want to go to one of these meetings? I called him in the morning. He was hungover. That's the time you want to get him. And he said, yeah, yeah, I really need to. And I came to pick him up later that day. I came to pick him up later that day, and, uh, and he had been drinking. He said, no, nah, I don't want to go to that thing. And a week later, he walked off a balcony and fell 40 feet and, and, and um, paralyzed himself. And so for the last 24 years, he, he has been uh, in a wheelchair, but he stayed committed to, to being a practicing alcoholic. And it killed him. He, a couple days ago, he died. And, and, you know, I'm not saying this to bum everybody out because uh, scared tactics do not work with alcoholics. Uh, it, you know, what works is when we hit a bottom and we decide we're ready. Because, you know, it's impossible to get someone sober 15 minutes before they're ready to get sober. And most people never get sober. And that's really my point. My point is most people never get sober. So just being sober, you know, a day at a time, being here with, with all of you guys, I mean, it's just, it's just phenomenal that we're all here. And, you know, my, my buddy Joey the Jets here, who I've known for a long time, who's done some extensive research, but um, <clears throat> he's here with us, and Paul's here. I have the honor to sponsor, and humble Hank, who I've known since I was a kid, and Paul Sponsee, and, and you know what? There's so many people tonight in this room that I know, Sean. I mean, I walked in here, and it's like family. And it's like that all over uh, AA on, on the west side and Hollywood. There's people that I've known for 25 years. And I just, I want to just wrap up with this. Um, I always wanted to be loved and accepted. And what I've been shown by the people in Alcoholics Anonymous is if I take the initiative and don't wait and I'm loving and accepting, then everywhere I go and anything I do, I will be loved and accepted if I take the initiative. But if I go like this and go, yeah, fuck you, just love me. <laughs> doesn't work. So, so I've learned, you guys have taught me that I have to take the initiative. And you know, my, my father is still sober. Uh, my sister is sober. My little brother is sober. So our family is absolutely a miracle. <coughs> and it's a miracle that it's, we are a miracle and it's all because of sobriety. It's, it's literally saved my life and the life of, of my family. And, um, and I just want to remind myself that uh, with, with all of you, there's nothing that I can't do or accomplish, and uh, alone I'm doomed. So if you, some of you guys are just coming around here, hang out, because when I got here, I hung out a lot, and I still hang out a lot. I go to a lot of meetings, and I'm always hanging out with alcoholics. And um, it's so important that we... For me, it's so important that I take the initiative in being loving and accepted. I, I sponsor a guy today. I've been sponsoring this guy four or five months, and I was talking to him last night. I said, listen, when a guy puts his hand up, I want you to go over and get his number, and I want you to call him because he's probably not going to call you. And he said, well, I don't know. Why, why should I? And I said, well, when you were new, didn't, didn't – people do that to you? And he said, no, you're the only person that did, and that's why I ask you to sponsor me. So I think it's so important 
to remember that our primary purpose is, you know, to carry the message uh, to other alcoholics. And I want to thank you for my life.